Hi everyone, welcome to Bold Conjectures with Paris Chopra. Today I am with Richard Watson, who is an associate professor at the Institute for Life Sciences at the University of Southampton. His research interests span artificial life and mechanisms of evolution. Uh, along with his collaborators, he's pioneering a new way of looking at biological evolution. So the current dominant view of evolution is that of natural selection, uh, which suggests that those organisms who outcompete others survive and end up passing their genes to the next generation. That's all well and good, but uh, according to uh, Richard, there is another mechanism at play that he calls natural induction. Uh, that view explains how adaptations can arise in biological systems uh, without natural selection. Uh, evolution is the reason why we see all the complexity around us. So understanding it from this new lens is going to be very enriching. So let's attempt to do exactly that in the next hour or so. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Richard. Oh, thank you very much, Paris. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so my first question really relates to your career trajectory. Uh, your PhD was in computer science. How did you get interested in studying mechanisms of evolution? I have, I was inspired by David Attenborough's life on earth when I was a child. And I understood his description of natural selection at that time. And when I was studying uh, my master's program much later in computer science at Sussex University, I came across evolutionary algorithms. So they're computational methods inspired by natural evolution. Uh, so that seemed to bring my interests together. So I've had a sort of computer science sort of track, but uh, now I got to think about how, how, what exactly is the algorithm that produces uh, biological complexity and adaptation that we see in the natural world, and how can we understand that well enough that we might exploit it for engineering purposes in some cases. All right. So you started from maybe a, a mix of, uh, application and curiosity uh, from a computer science point of view, and then evolution as a whole start, started interesting you. Yeah, so my research questions now are definitely motivated by biological evolution more than they're motivated by engineering methods. But the engineering computer science hat is a, uh, a particular lens through which we can see natural evolutionary processes, right? So there's lots of detail in biology that may be important for how evolution works. Is it important that chromosomes are diploid? Is it important that there's sexual recombination? Is it important that nucleotides are bunched together into little sections of DNA we call genes? Which of these details are important for the algorithm of evolution and which aren't? And when you have a computer science hat on, you can dig a little deeper to say, well, if the problem you were trying to solve had this kind of a nature to it, then this difference in the algorithm would be important, whereas this difference in the algorithm wouldn't really make much difference, right? So that's a, it's a particular lens through which to see biological processes. So that's how they come together. So you're interested in seeing which are the principles that are most abstract versus some, what are the things that are perhaps incidental to biology? Well, so I spent quite a bit of time in the field of evolutionary algorithms, looking at the, the benefit of crossover or sexual recombination, we would say in evolutionary biology, what kind of problem can you solve with an algorithm that uses crossover, uh, taking genetic material from a bit from parent one and a bit from parent two and smushing them together? What kind of problem can you solve with that mechanism that you can't solve just by small mutations or large, large random mutations for that matter? All right. So that's an example. And another example would be how does coevolution, where the evolution of one individuals in one population modifies the selective pressure on another population, and then its adaptation modifies the selective pressure on the first. How can that kind of an arms race or perhaps a cooperative relationship between those two populations, how does that alter uh, the kind of problem that natural selection can solve? So those are some examples. Right. Okay, so can we spend a little bit of time maybe just setting the background? Um, uh, Charles Darwin proposed um, uh, evolution by natural selection. Maybe it's more than 100 years now. And uh, uh, wanted to just get uh, maybe, you know, first an understanding of what natural selection is as 
it was initially proposed and i think it's the explanation itself okay. has evolved over a period of time and now it, there's this whole dominant paradigm called modern yeah, synthesis yeah i mean so, i mean surprisingly the principles that he described stand today in modern evolutionary thinking about how evolution works right so the principles can be summarized as heritable variation in reproductive success and that one sentence captures uh quite a bit of the detail that matters in the assumptions that matter so uh you have to have a population of things that are reproducing it has to be the case that they're not all the same we call that variation it has to be the case that some of those differences make a difference to the survival and reproduction of those entities and it has to be the case that those differences can be passed on to the next generation heritable variation in reproductive success and if you have those four characteristics then natural selection follows and we understand that uh sort of intuitively um uh casually I'm going to the right word um as the survival of the fittest sort of algorithm where there are some entities that are better suited to their environment including their competitive relationships with other individuals and they survive and others don't so there's a filtering process there of uh separating out the things to retain from the things to discard which is done naturally in natural selection you know an organism that's well suited to its environment survives naturally in an organism that isn't doesn't uh and those that survive then obviously have a greater opportunity for reproductive uh um opportunity for the to contribute to the next generation um and even if all of the organisms survive some may, there may be differences in their opportunity to contribute to the next generation and that uh in that way the composition of the population changes over time but the fundamental principle is one of differential survival uh, and reproduction that there's a differences in how well organisms survive and differences in how well organisms reproduce right uh, that's a principle i don't know if that's jumping in too quick too soon so that notion of survival of the fittest is uh not just a theory of biological evolution but it seems like it's um not just natural but logical um indeed the way that darwin described it is he he describes those axioms if you have those four things heritability variation fitness differences and uh, reproduction then there must be natural selection natural selection follows but if we think about things from a uh a sort of um individual utility maximization point of view like what's what's the best thing for me to do and so the best thing for me to do is whatever maximizes my utility function uh and natural selection can be thought of as being it's often thought of as being a short-sighted or blind process in that it the variations which survive the filter of selection have no um take no heed of the long-term consequences of those changes right if they survive and reproduce better in the next generation then there'll be more of them whether that's going to lead to long-term collapse as in a tragedy of the commons for example natural selection doesn't care natural selection has no interest in the long-term consequences they don't alter which things get selected and it has no interest in the consequences for others either it's only the differential reproduction of the unit not of its consequences for others don't matter the collective interest so it's short-sighted and self-interested rather than long-sighted and uh, collective interest right so uh, on the question on the topic of unit uh, i mean when we say survival of the fittest i think there have been several debates uh, survival of you know what unit what's the unit of selection is it the organism yeah. is it the gene which is popularized by the book selfish gene or there have been debates about uh, selection of uh, groups as well the group selection so what's your view on that how is that debate evolved and uh, is that an important debate or is it just semantics yeah good question so uh back in the uh the middle of the previous century when edwards was talking about you know why does this organism not eat too much grass right why does it not uh create a tragedy of the commons and um, and gave explanations like well if it did that would cause the species to collapse in future generations so in order to avoid uh 
that in order to do what's best for the species, the adaptation of prudent predation, of not overpredating, is obviously what's best, and that's why natural selection uh, favors it. Uh, but that makes no sense, right? So if the individual organism gains benefit by eating more grass in the short term, all that means is that an individual that does that leaves more offspring in the next generation. So that's what happens, right? There's no forethought or concern for others involved. It's an automatic process of what gets through to the next generation, not a long-sighted optimization process. So the casual sort of not well thought through notion of group selection, definitely wrong. Definitely don't want to invoke that kind of group selection. Uh, the genes I view, uh, what should we say about that? Uh, so the Dawkins popularized the genes I view because the thing that gets reliably copied from one generation to the next is not the phenotype or that's the, you know, the, the, the physical form or the behavior of the organism, it's the genetic material. Uh, so only the genetic material really survives over multiple generations. And moreover, it's not the entirety of the genetic material that survives because it keeps getting broken up by sexual recombination. So whereas a particular gene might exist in a lineage that passes down through many generations, the combination of genes in a particular individual might never occur again, that through crossover sexual reproduction, you get a new combination of genes in the next generation. So if the only thing that really persists over time is a piece of genetic material that's small enough to not get broken up by recombination, then it seems like the unit is just the gene. And that way of thinking about things has been highly successful in many aspects of biology, including thinking about what, are there any circumstances in which uh, an apparently altruistic behavior could be favored by selection, so a behavior that uh, provides benefit to others, how could that possibly be selected? And a classic example is something like uh, when a bee defends the nest and stings uh, an invader, it causes the individual bee to die. How could that stinging behavior uh, possibly evolve by natural selection since it's detrimental to the individual? And the genes I view way of thinking about that is to say, but it's not the individual that is successful from that behavior. It's the gene that's successful from that behavior. And the way that it's successful is that by doing so, it protects other copies of the genes in the colony, other copies of that gene in the colony. So by sacrificing its life, by producing an altruistic behavior that's detrimental to itself, but beneficial to others, it's really the selfish gene that's benefiting other copies of itself in other individuals. And in that way, we get to explain away the behavior that appeared to be altruistic at the organismic level in favor of a gene's eye view where, oh, look, it was all selfish after all. It was just that gene trying to make more copies of itself. And the way that it could do that in this particular circumstances was by causing self-sacrifice of the bee. But in, that was in order to proliferate those copies of the gene. That's the gene's eye view. So there have been those arguments about What's the right level of selection? Should we think about it as the organism? Should we think about it as the group? Should we think about it as the gene for quite a while? But one of the things that's been more prominent in thinking about uh, units of selection in the last 10, 15 years has been uh, the evolutionary transitions in individuality. So these are the transitions from, at multiple scales of biological organization, the most well known is the transition from single celled life to multicellular life. But there are other examples from self replicating molecules in the primordial soup to the first protocells, uh, individual self replicating genes to the first chromosomes, uh, prokaryote bacteria to the eukaryote cells with multiple um, uh, organelles of, of symbiotic origin from other bacteria, then the multicellular organisms, and then the eusocial insects like the bees that I mentioned just now. And in each of these transitions, there's been a change in scale of what the relevant unit is to the selective process. That in effect, um, a gene that uh, used to do well in the primordial soup now only does well if it works together well with the other genes that are in the chromosome. And the chromosome only works well if it works together 
survives and reproduces well if it works together well with the other chromosomes in the cell. And likewise, the organelles within the eukaryote cell and the individual cells within a multicellular organism need to work together in order to produce uh, their own longevity through multiple generations by working together with other cells in a multicellular organism. So it's not just a question of what is the right level, but how do the levels change? Over evolutionary time, it, was, it couldn't have been the case that the multicellular organism was the right level to think about the unit because it didn't exist. It used to be from most of the evolutionary history of life on Earth, life wasn't multicellular, it was single-celled. Right. So how, the, how evolution changed uh, the structure of the relationships between units of selection at one level of organization to change them into a network of dependencies such that now, well, they're still self-interested, but given this network of dependencies they have, the options that they have mean that the only way in which they can get ahead is by cooperating and coordinating with the other cells in that network of dependencies in which they exist. And that seems kind of strange because why would a cell get itself into a situation where it can no longer reproduce and as an individual anymore, right? A somatic cell in your body, anything that's not in the germline, the right. sperm and the egg, doesn't get to survive into the next generation. Why would a single-celled organism get itself into such a situation? And the classic, the classic answer to that is, yeah, but you're thinking about it at the wrong level. You should have been thinking about it at the gene level again, because all of the cells within the multicellular organism are genetically related. So it's really just a selfish gene story that this gene proliferates well because it creates some cells that don't survive and other cells that do. But it turns out that that's not, that's not enough of a story for a, for a lot of reasons. There are, it doesn't explain, for example, the transition from individual self-replicating genes to chromosomes because those genes were not related to one another, the genes on the chromosome. Yeah, so I mean, I do want to get into that because that's a, like a segue into understanding more about uh, natural induction. So before that, I uh, wanted to also understand, I mean, natural selection is obviously quite beautiful. Uh, it's logical. It explains uh, so much. What actually forced you to question it? Uh, I, I, uh, what what mean do you say, you know, hey, maybe there is something beyond it, uh, which would be actually quite uh, controversial, I imagine, when you would be first thinking and proposing it. Yeah, so Richard Dawkins makes a very strong case that it's not only is it, uh, as a matter of empirical fact, natural selection is the mechanism that explains all biological complexity on Earth, but he makes a strong case that that's the only way that it could possibly work. If you found life on another planet and it had complex adaptations, it would have to have been produced by natural selection, an equivalent algorithmic process in whatever, it might be in a slightly different substrate, it might not. In principle, it might not be DNA, but it would still have to be a natural selection process. And his argument is basically that, well, it has to work by small changes because large changes that were beneficial would be magical, right? You'd have it would be too much of a coincidence to have a large random change that was beneficial. Uh, and if it works by that's because the changes can't be directed. They can't be biased to produce things which are good because that would suggest some sort of forethought in the mechanism that was creating those changes. So if the changes are random and small, then they have to be accumulated incrementally over long periods of time. And you basically end up with a natural selection process, something that filters the good changes from the bad changes. And that's what natural selection is. So that kind of argument suggests that not only is natural selection a simple and elegant story about how uh, an adaptive process can optimize uh, solutions, you might not find globally optimal solutions, but it optimizes. Uh, and it appears to be universal. And that kind of universality, it's not just a theory about um, what exobiology, it's not just a theory about the life on other planets. It also says that there are strict limits to the kind of systems that can exhibit adaptation here on Earth. Right. So Gaia, for example, the idea that the planet, the biosphere, is organized in a way that's like an organism that's adapted for holistic uh, 
self-regulation feedbacks can't be true because the planet isn't an evolutionary unit. And if it isn't an evolutionary unit and natural selection is the only possible mechanism that can produce adaptation spontaneously in natural systems, then anything which isn't an evolutionary unit can't be adapted. So that universality also places strict limits on the kinds of things that can be adapted. It's the same reason that loose social groups can't be uh, adapted because they're undermined by the selection of the individuals therein. That's the dominant selective unit rather than the group. Uh, and it also means that even things like uh, human organizational societal structures and uh, uh, institutions can't be adapted unless one of two things is possible. So unless there's a natural selection process that says this method of government or this institution or this social structure survived and outcompeted other institutions, that's one way in which it could be better over time, or it would have to be because we designed it with our own intellect. Right? Right. There isn't any other natural process that could do it. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. um, I didn't answer your question about why I became skeptical. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and what, uh, I mean, you, you were talking about limitations of natural selection. I think that also connects to the same question. Yeah. So um, one thing that natural selection can't explain that needs to be explained. So you could say, well, I don't, I don't need something to explain why Gaia is intelligent or why Gaia is adaptive because it isn't. Mm. How do you know it isn't? But because it can't be. How do you know it can't be? Well, because natural selection is the only mechanism that can make anything adapted. So it can't be, right? So, so we could argue about that. But one thing that definitely needs explaining is how does evolution do those transitions from one level of organization to another? And that has a really interesting chicken and egg problem, right? Because if you have a higher level of selection, then you can explain why the components within that organization have to cooperate with one another. Because if the multicellular organism is the unit of selection, then the cells have to cooperate. The only way in which they can get into the next generation is by working together to make the organism more successful. But you can't presuppose the new level of selection to explain how the units work together to create it, right? There's a chicken and egg problem. But we started off with some units that weren't in a multicellular organism. Why did they get themselves into a situation where they had to give up their individuality, had to give up their Darwinian fitness? Why would an individual do that? You can explain it requires a lot of working together and a lot of cooperation for them to create a multicellular organism, and it requires some of them to self-sacrifice, or at least they can get themselves into situations where they do. But if that's the definition of a multicellular organism is that it of a new evolutionary unit is that the consequences of selection of that new unit can't be explained by selection on the units you all had before at the lower level, then how does selection on the lower level explain how you created the higher level unit? Does that make right. sense? So yes. the transitions in individuality were one of the key biological puzzles that motivated me to think about that differently. But you know, the other motivation is that evolutionary algorithms are rubbish. <laughs> Can you expand on that? Well, they're just a hill climbing process, aren't they? Right. You know, you know it's just a stochastic population based method of doing hill climbing. So if that's all it is, you know, what you do, right? You mean they're so like trivial? They, they just go to the nearest local optima and then you're done. Mm. And you know, maybe because you have a population, there's a, there's a sort of bet hedging thing that um, there's, if some of the individuals in the population or some of the lineages get stuck on a local optimum, maybe some of the others won't be unlucky and they'll be able to succeed and you can divert your computational resources to those individuals and pro uh, proliferate that lineage instead. It's a little bit more intelligent than running a hill climber multiple times and hoping you don't get stuck, but not much more intelligent. Right. And it's actually really difficult to show circumstances under which an evolutionary algorithm can do anything that a hill climber can't do. Mm. That's one of the reasons that I was interested in sexual recombination and crossover before to show whether there are any circumstances in which an evolutionary process can do something that a hill climber couldn't do. And you know, if that's all it is, then I find that kind of surprising, right? Because when we run a local search process like a hill climber or a simulated annealing or an evolutionary algorithm on difficult optimization problems, mm. 
or in large creative spaces, I mean, they definitely show some improvement at first, and then they get stuck or progress becomes very slow and you run it a month longer instead of overnight or maybe two, and it doesn't really do anything much better than you got in, a, in the first night. Right. Is that all it is then? <laughs> and I think that the, the, the multiple scales of adaptive organization, multi-scale autonomy, you know, right from, you know, you look at the detail of what's going on inside an individual cell or the detail of the complexity in an individual protein even, from you know, proteins to molecular networks to cells to multicellular organisms. It's like, really? Just with a hill climber, you did that? That, you know, well, maybe, but maybe we're maybe we're being a little bit too narrow-minded. Right? The assumption is, well, it it must be possible to evolve that with a hill climber. Why? Right. Well, because that's the only algorithm. It's like, well, is it? Right? Is that the only is that the only adaptive process that could possibly occur spontaneously in nature? Right. So the traditional uh, answer to this question of, for example, how does cooperation evolve is through random accident, in the sense eukaryotes happened when two pro- prokaryotes happened to merge, and yeah. they, they they thought it. I mean, then it it was like a beneficial situation for both of them. And your um, your thesis is that probably that's a uh, little bit impossible uh, to happen, these accidents, or if they happen, probably they'll not uh, be the de facto units of selection and they'll not spread. Yeah, well, we don't, we don't accept happy accidents as an explanation for any other kind of adaptation in evolution, right? We don't say That's true. It, we, we take happy accidents are okay if they're small, right? Even small incremental changes accumulated over time. And then the large change is not a happy accident. It was selected, right? It was a hill climbing process. Uh, It could be the case that a transition from a free living uh, host cell and a symbiotic cyanobacteria, one just happened to get inside the cell membrane of another one day, and thereafter they lived as a pair instead of as, as individuals in competition with each other. And the relationship sort of changed overnight that now instead of being in competition with one another because they're a single unit through a happy accident, now they have to get along together and they have to cooperate together and their their, um, contributions to their relationship become more complementary and sort of um, fine-tuned to one another. But it seems that we that we wouldn't accept that explanation in any other part of biology. We'd have to say, no, that they, their relationship where they initially, they didn't care about one another, they were doing their own thing, that there, there was some ecological relationship there, one of them could get a benefit from the other or vice versa. That relationship becomes tighter and tighter over an evolutionary time. Uh, the symbiosis becomes not just a sort of uh, optional complementarity, but more sort of obligate that now they can't survive without each other. And somehow that transitions into, oh, they've become a new evolutionary unit. Right. Now, one of them is actually sacrificing their fitness in order for the, for what? For the greater good, for the long-term collective interest instead of the short-term self-interest. And that's that doesn't really quite make sense yet. We need to understand how that happens in its mood. Right. So your thesis uh, in a nutshell is that uh, ecosystems should get stuck in some sort of local optima as per natural well, selection, but yeah, we've not so, seen yes. that. We've seen increased complexity over the whole trajectory of life. So I think that a, a sensible place to start, perhaps, is to acknowledge that there are other contexts in which we understand that natural selection isn't the only adaptive process possible. So our brains do adaptation, and machine learning algorithms do adaptation, and they don't need to use natural selection to do that. Right? When you learn something, you don't need to make small random modifications to your brain and keep the brain that works better. You don't even need to make small random modifications to the connections or the neurons and keep the connections or the neurons that work better. And, you know, there might be selection processes at the synaptic level inside heads, but when you model it in an artificial neural network, you see that's, that's not really the point, right? The point isn't, do you change the weights through random variation and selection? The point is that the weights change in the direction uh, in a particular direction determined by a machine learning algorithm. And that causes the organization of the connections in the network to change in a way that makes it better at the task. 
and the the observation that made a sort of leap for me um, was noticing that if you allow natural selection to modify the connections of a neural network, then it modifies them in the same direction that a machine learning algorithm would modify them, right? So we, we know this now because we use evolutionary algorithms in some contexts to evolve neural network weights instead of using learning algorithms. So there we're taking a sort of a different kind of, instead of using a gradient method within a neural network, we use a stochastic variation and selection process within a neural network. And it's sort of obvious in hindsight that well, the reason that we changed the weights that way with the learning mechanism was because that's the direction that made the output better. And the reason that natural selection changes the weights in the same way is because against that objective function, that's the direction that makes the output better. So it kind of makes sense that they would change the connections of a network in the same way. If there was a variation and selection process at the microscopic level, it would change the network architecture in the same way that a machine learning algorithm does. But um, the thing that makes um, machine learning algorithms, neural network algorithms, for example, there's a couple of things to say. The thing that makes them interesting is not that you change the weights in the direction that made the output better. That's not what makes them interesting. The thing that makes them interesting is induction, that there are many different internal organizations that could produce an output that was good. But out of the many possible models that could do that, you've induced a particular model. And that particular model means that it generalizes differently on other samples, right? In machine learning, we're not interested in how well you do on the training set. We're interested in how well you do on the test set. How well does it generalize to situations that haven't been seen before, haven't been observed before, weren't part of the training set. And you can't explain why a machine learning algorithm does well on the test set purely by referring to how well it did on the training set. It's like, why did it do well on this novel circumstance? It's like, oh, because it was well fitted to the training set. It's like, no, being well fitted to the training set only explains why you were well fitted to the training set. It doesn't explain how you got the right answer on this novel uh, situation, right? The way that you got the right answer on the novel situation was because you did induction, not selection. The ability to generalize relies on your ability to create general rules from specific instances. So the training set is a set of specific instances, and the model that you've induced is a general model from those specific instances, and that's what enables you to generalize. So the conception of natural selection in the conventional view doesn't include any notion of generalization or induction. It just says, why is this thing good? because it survived and reproduced. Right. That's, what, that's why it's there, because it survived and reproduced. It's like it already did well on the training set. That's the answer, right? And that means that it can't have, there's no notion of it being able to anticipate or generalize or um, be predisposed to produce things which are beneficial but novel. It can only produce things which are have already survived the filter of selection or random variations thereof, right? So the closest that you can get to a notion of generalization in a conventional model of natural selection is just similarity or closeness in the original feature space, right? So there's a sense in which when you sprinkle random mutations on a genotype, you're making an assumption that other good things are near the good things you already had. So that's a very, very limited kind of generalization. It's not even as good as extrapolation, right? Right. Um, but when you have a, a, a machine learning algorithm with some sophistication to the model, it doesn't have to be very sophisticated. It might just be an ordinary correlation model. Uh, it's not just regurgitating the things that have been trained on or things which are close to the things that have been trained on, but it can also generate things which are new combinations of those features which are novel uh, or more generally other patterns which have the same underlying structural regularities even though they're not previously been seen before right and if evolution can do that then if biological evolution can do that then that makes it 
a much more powerful adaptive algorithm. And that's what the idea of natural induction is, that when natural selection acts on an ordinary vector of traits or an ordinary vector of genes, well, that's just natural selection. But when natural selection operates on a network of dependencies between things, that network of dependencies isn't actually determined by past selection. It's induced by past selection. It's induced because it enables generalization and that network of dependencies can generate other samples which were not in the training set. And it means that an evolutionary process that is inducing an internalized model can do things like the evolution of evolvability and pre-adaptation and anticipation that can't be done when you don't have a, a network model that's changing over time. Right. Uh, so can, can, can you elucidate this with an example? Uh, yeah, yeah. Good idea. So the other thing that's, the other thing that's um, important about that is that you can do adaptation in machine learning systems without having a supervised learning feedback. You can do it with unsupervised learning. And because you can get something like a Hopfield network to uh, learn to solve optimization problems better with experience without uh, a supervised feedback on it, that means that systems which aren't evolutionary units can also do that same kind of trick. So to illustrate that, my student Daniel Power did a model of a ecosystem, which is represented by a sort of community matrix of how does the density of one species affect the growth rate of another species. So you, there's an obvious analogy there with the neural network that if you set up the connections between species to represent the connections of a network, it could compute the same kind of thing and it could express the same kind of dynamics. But we're not going to design it to have the right dynamics. We're going to let it evolve, but crucially, we're not going to apply selection at the network level. We're only going to supply, apply selection at the node level. So in an ecosystem, usually an ecosystem is not an evolutionary unit, right? It's not the case that an ecosystem has characteristics that can be passed on to descendant ecosystems over and above the characteristics of the individuals it contains, right? Individual selection is, is the operating function. That's why Gaia, the planet as a whole, can't be adapted because you don't have a population of planets that are producing offspring planets with heritable characteristics like the planets they came from, right? You, in order for it to be adapted by natural selection, you'd need a process like that. So this is a model which is just based on uh, changes, you know, what an individual in one species which survives and reproduces better than another replaces other individuals in that species. But we're interested in how that changes the structure of the network as a whole, even though that's not an evolutionary unit. And to uh, if we set up those um, interaction coefficients to be competitive interactions between species, uh, individual selection within each species will, well, what would it do? It, it's individual selection within each species just favors individuals that grow faster than individuals that grow slower. And which ones grow faster? Well, it's the ones that are less competitive with other individuals. Uh, which are they? Well, if it's competitive with another species that's in high density at the same time that it is, then that's bad. But if it's competitive with another species that's low density when it's high density, that doesn't really matter. So it's always a good idea to reduce your competition with other species. An individual that has less competition with other species grows faster than an individual that has more competition. But there's a, a differential um, selective pressure on which interaction coefficients are more important to the growth rate of an individual. And in particular, what we see in that um, scenario is that species which are in high density at the same time, uh, it's very important for them to reduce their competition. To, well, I'm going to go and eat something else. You do, you do that, I'm going to go and eat something else to reduce the competition between them. It's called character displacement. Uh, but species where one is high and the other is low or vice versa, it doesn't really matter whether you alter that competition coefficient. And that means that species which are selected together wire together through individual level natural selection. And that has the same functional form as neurons that fire wire together 
neurons are fired together, wired together in uh, heavy in learning in a neural network, even under unsupervised uh, heavy in learning. So that means that the ecosystem as a whole, the individuals within each species have been driven by natural selection, but the ecosystem as a whole is doing unsupervised associative learning. And unsupervised associative learning is sufficient for the network to learn how to solve problems better with experience. And the example that Dan did just to show off was to get the ecosystem to solve Sudoku puzzles. Um, just uh, it, it's interesting. Just to make sure I get that right. Um, so your, I mean this this whole uh, model is about if individual sort of species tend to not compete and go their own ways, it's uh, sort of beneficial uh, for the group as a whole. Uh, and that's so where the evolution. There is no stem. benefit for the group as a whole, right? Because the group as a whole is not an evolutionary unit. So the reason that these changes are being selected is not because it's beneficial for the group as a whole. That would require a higher level selection process. The reason that these changes are being selected is just because it was good for the individual. But we observe that the, the selective pressures created by the dynamics in the network cause some connections to change and other connections not. And we can understand under individual selection and we can understand what the organizational change of those connections is because it's equivalent to unsupervised learning at the system scale. I don't need a population of ecosystems to do that. And I don't right. need to see how good is this ecosystem and how good is that ecosystem, right? And it's not so much that reducing competition is good for the system. It's that if in, reducing competition is always good for all the individuals, but it's more a case of which competitive relationships are more important to change, right? right? So the competitive relationships between two individuals which are in high density at the same time, they're important to reduce, but the competitive relationships between two individuals which are not in high density at the same time are not important to reduce. And that differential easing of the frustrations in the system is a much more general principle, and it's a principle which applies at the network scale. So you can do the same thing without any natural selection at all. My colleague Chris Buckley at Sussex has shown how you can do the same thing in a system of masses connected by springs, right? So the masses, the position of the mass represents whether the species is in high density or low density, and the springs between them are the competitive interactions. This is when this spring is high, the spring, the spring, when this particle is high, the spring pushes that particle low and vice versa. And when you set up the particles to be in initial positions and then let it go, the springs push it all around and they find a configuration which is stable, but it's not a very good solution to a Sudoku puzzle, right? It's just a, you know, it's just a locally optimal solution to a Sudoku puzzle. And then you randomize the positions of the particles and you have another go and it finds another locally optimal solution to a Sudoku puzzle. And you do that many, many times and it just finds many rubbish solutions to the Sudoku puzzle. It doesn't find a good one. But now imagine that the springs are not perfect. They're not perfectly elastic. If you a perfectly elastic spring, you can stretch it or compress it. And when you let it go, it goes back to the same natural length. It doesn't have any uh, residual deformation of that past experience. But if they're imperfect, the, the more stress they're under, the more they deform. So if you stretch them for too long or too far, they give way a little bit and they change their natural length. And of course, natural springs behave in exactly that way. Well, now the system of particles and springs begins to learn that distribution of locally optimal solutions that it's visited, meaning that the springs give way in a little bit that increase the dynamical basin of attraction for positions that the system has been to in the past. And the generalization properties of associative learning mean that it doesn't just go to solutions that it's been to in the past, but it also generates other solutions, which are generalizations of those. And that causes the system of particles to find better solutions over time. And that's the principle that the, it's the same algorithm that the ecosystem is doing. The fact that it was natural selection at the individual level that was changing the connections is incidental. It's really the network level learning that's doing the work. Right. So in the former, again, to recapture, I understand it's the natural selection happening at nodes, but as a consequence of it, the relationship between nodes is uh, changing, even though there is no selection happening at the relationship level. And this change in relationship between nodes uh, is what is uh, doing induction 
and learning yeah. in some sense. Um, yeah. So, so, I mean, you, in order to get any kind of learning happening in a network, it has to be that the connections change. Right. But it has to be the right connections that change. And this shows that you don't need selection at the network level in order to get the right connections to change. Right. Over a, if the system is perturbed so that it visits a distribution of locally optimal configurations, then over time it will naturally generalize over that to enlarge the basin of attraction for solutions it hasn't visited before, but which are better. Right. Um, so I did want to understand uh, in, in what concrete sense this generalization and what, what are we calling generalization as? And I mean, Sudoku is interesting, uh, but uh, I, I mean, in ecosystems, uh, I'm not sure if they're solving Sudoku. Yeah, so, so what is generalization so can, or induction? Sudoku is an example of a, of a, it can be described as a max two set problem, right? So you have a number of problem variables and a number of constraints or dependencies between those variables that says, well, when this one is one, this one should be zero. When this one is zero, this one should be zero. There's constraints between them that, that, uh, and Sudoku is just a particular example of that. Right. It says, you know, if you're a three, then you can't be on at the same time as other threes, which are in the same row or column or box. So um, in biological terms, a, 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 a constraint maximization problem says something like, well, look, if I'm using this resource, you can't be using that resource, right? That there's a mutual exclusion between us. There are constraints between our, our growth rates. And so, the problem that the ecosystem is solving is a constrained resource allocation problem. Who's going to eat this and who's going to eat that, right? And uh, obviously, each of the individuals in each of the species wants to eat as much as they can. But if they have to choose, well, if I, if I eat this thing, I'm competing with this other species that's in high density. Whereas if I eat that thing, I'm not competing with that other species or I am competing with them, but they're not in high density at the same time as me. And that way of um, that way of adjusting the uh, dependencies in the network enables the ecosystem to better resolve those conflicts over time, which essentially results in higher biomass for the ecosystem. So the immature ecosystem ends up at what's called a climax community, like a, a local equilibrium, where you know, the species which are in high density or high density, the species which are in low density or low density, but they can't change. It's an attractor of the system, but there's lots of conflict going on. And even if you were to um, go through the next annual season and you grow the ecosystem up again to another climax community, it might be a bit different, but it still has lots of conflict going on. But over evolutionary time, as the relationships between the species change, the ecosystem gets better at finding combinations of species that work well together, that resolve those conflicts and thus enable higher, a mature ecosystem and it enables higher total biomass than the immature ecosystem could. Right. So, uh, so it's robust to changes. It's not catastrophic to some changes. Yeah, so happening. there are interesting implications for what happens to the resilience and agility of the ecosystem as well as its ability to optimize those conflicting constraints. Uh, so one thing that's uh, kind of interesting is that the longer that an ecosystem spends in one particular configuration, eventually that becomes the only memory that the ecosystem has, that it just, you know, it just, it's like training a neural network on one training pattern over and over again. And eventually there'll be a sort of catastrophic forgetting that it can't remember anything else that it's ever seen, right? This is the only thing that it can do. And that has the consequence that if, uh, a different um, environmental or ecological condition should arise that it used to be able to cope with it now isn't able to cope with that. It's lost that robustness or resilience. The same, uh, I like, you know, a, a way to understand it would be something like it's not so much the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, it's the long period of stability without them that killed the dinosaurs, right? The, the ecological conditions are uh, have. Um, um, hold, um, honed, been canalized to a particular um, environmental condition. And when that changes, they don't have the agility uh, to be able to reorganize the ecosystem. Right. So um, ecosystems at any point of time are in a particular configuration. Uh, they have some relationships. Um, 
so by the word induction i um, my sense is that it's something which is forward looking it's anticipating uh, something in the future it's generalizable so when ecosystems are in a particular configuration at any moment of time in what sense uh, are you calling uh, what what is it really anticipating uh, yeah where, so the where species does the induction comes yeah yeah so at any particular time the species densities are what they are right but the uh the characteristics of those individuals can change the nature of the relationships with other species right so if i evolve to eat a different resource or to change the balance of the resources that i use that changes the effective competition that i have with other species that are also consuming those resources and the nature of that of those characteristics affecting the nature of the relationships between species gives the ecosystem uh, a sort of latent potential to produce particular patterns uh in it not just the one pattern that it's in right now right so uh in the same way that a uh a neural network might be producing it might be at a, if it's a recurrent network it might be at a particular attractor right now but the structure of the connections between the neurons has a latent potential to produce other patterns it hasn't forgotten everything else it has multiple it can store multiple memories you can do the same trick by the way in a neural network in the ecological system that i was just talking about or in a gene regulation network what's important is that there's a sort of differential easing of the frustrations in the connections and that's what's inducing a, an associative model of things which have worked in the past okay does that make sense of why it's induction yeah i mean uh, to me it um, it it suggests as an ecosystem it's just more robust uh wherein i mean robust in the sense if there's a neural network it works on a case which it has never seen before which is the test case and similarly in ecosystem uh, uh it sort of holds together uh if if maybe an individual changes too much in a direction that ecosystem collectively has never observed before yeah so i think it's a mistake to think of Uh, you know an ecosystem is supposed to be one particular way right mm. so the the uh you know um there's a number of things potentially wrong with that uh but the imagine that you have so you can show that uh, an ecosystem in this model at least has uh multiple memories of past configurations that if a particular subset of species is stimulated by a particular environment of conditional resource availability to be in high density at the same time they then recruit other species according to the connections that they have with them that produces a particular climax community and in a neural network you would call that as an associative memory or recognition right that right. you you start off with a particular either a corrupted or a partial stimulus and you get back the whole pattern right um and an ecosystem can do that too and it would mean that the pattern that it produces can be appropriate for the environmental conditions that it's in not just that well the ecosystem does this and it gets more robust at doing that right it's not just one answer right got it i mean just like in uh, like a uh hebbian network you can store different memories like maybe characters a b c d and partial uh partial sort of uh, activation of say part of that character induces the entire character in the network right. in a similar sense you're saying the network has potential to be multiple things at the same time uh because of the connections uh, uh some are stronger so and some are weaker that's right so all if if it's the case that evolution by natural selection under individual level natural selection changes the connections in an ecosystem in the same way that hedge rule changes connections in a neural network in a, in a in a hot field network for example then that means that all the cool things the hot field networks can do ecosystems can do too so in a hot field network hedge rule is sufficient to do a uh, memory to store and recall multiple patterns of past activation to train it to have multiple memories it can do generalization that in addition to producing the patterns it's been trained on it can also produce other attractors that are from the same class in an associative memory you'd call that a spurious memory but if you were interested in generalization you'd say it was a generalization uh and you can also learn to solve optimization problems better with experience right or build 
low dimensional models of high dimensional spaces. That's another thing that you can do with Hebb's rule in a Hopfield network. And when you move in that low dimensional space, instead of in the original high dimensional space, you can uh, satisfy constraints between problem variables better than you could without those, without that induced model. Right. So it's a, it's a mechanism it's called, we call um, self-modeling that a, a Hopfield, so Hopfield and Tank did a model where they set up the weights of the network to represent the distances between cities in a TSP problem. And then you run the network and it gives you a locally optimal solution to the tour of the TSP problem, right? Uh, but there was no learning in that model. It just, you know, it, it finds a locally optimal solution to the tour. If you run it again, it would find another locally optimal solution to the tour. It might be slightly different. But if you do that many times and you use heavy and learning to modify the connections, then it can learn to get better at solving the TSP problem over time. So that's what the ecosystem is doing here. It's doing the same kind of learning, generalization, recognition, classification behaviors that a Hopkins network can do, the ecosystem can do as well. And because you can do that with unsupervised learning in the Hopfield network, you don't need any system level selection, system level natural selection to do that in the ecosystem. Right, okay. So connecting now, getting back to uh, the limitations of natural selection, uh... In what way does it explain this emergence of uh, higher levels of units from yeah. cells to organisms or from genes to chromosomes? So we don't have a full working model of that yet, but it does provide some way forward there that we don't have through a pure natural selection model. And the important thing is that natural induction explains how adaptive organization can arise at a level of organization that's greater than the evolutionary unit. So in that ecosystem model, uh, the adaptation, the ability to solve to Zucker puzzles doesn't belong to any of the individual species. And there wasn't any selection at the ecosystem level. So we've got an adaptive process happening at the system level without selection at the system level. So the selection at the lower level is producing a change in organization that produces adaptation at the higher level. And natural induction explains how that can happen using the principles of associative learning rather than the processes of selection. And that means that you could, it gives us a clue at least about how a community of single celled organisms that are having multiple goes at living together would adapt their relationships to one another to create to get better at producing combinations of single cell organisms that work well. And that gives a sort of starting place for uh, adaptation at the higher level of organization before natural selection is instantiated at that level. So it's not a full story about how that could happen, but it's right. a it's a it's a way of moving between levels that doesn't require that happy accident that you mentioned before. That, Got but if, we, if they just jump into a boat together, now there's selection at the higher level, right? And then, then that's why they have to cooperate. Right. But before that, they were competing, but now they're cooperating because they're a unit. So now we have a story where, well, they started off competing because they were different units, but they learn how to live with one another better over time in a way that creates emergent adaptation at the system scale. And now it makes more sense that they get into a boat together, right? If they had... If they could cooperate in a way that created a high level unit, that would, that would enable them to capitalize on that cooperative behavior that they've already evolved. Right. So in your comparison of this with, uh, say, Hebbian networks or other such machine learning methods, uh, I mean, these machine learning methods always have some goal and goal in mind, either storing memory or solving Sudoku puzzles and so on. Uh, but uh, biological systems, uh, in, in, in some sense, they are blind. I mean, they're not problem-oriented per se. So, uh, so as a whole, um, uh, I mean, one of the phrases you mentioned is they collectively increase the biomass. Uh, so is that sort of the implicit goal of the whole uh, natural induction? I think a better way to understand it is that more of the components can be happy simultaneously. So if you imagine that each of the components have a goal already because they are evolutionary units already or because particles just want to move in the direction that the springs push them 
right? You don't have to personify, you don't have to involve natural selection, but each of those components has a behavior that it already does, or it has an incentive that it already wants to satisfy. The, the, the individuals within the species want to grow the quickest, right? But because of the constraints between them, they can't all do that at the same time. Or when they attempt to all do that at the same time, they end up in a configuration where some of them are doing it and some of them aren't, and the conflicts or constraints are preventing them from all doing it at the same time. Uh, so as the system organizes through natural induction, it gets better at resolving more of those constraints simultaneously so that more of the members are happy simultaneously. If we think about it in a game theory way, it's like we have uh, individuals in a network playing games, competitive games with each other, and you can measure the individual utility of all of the individuals playing those games. But the, they're not interested in the total utility, right? An individual chooses the strategy that maximizes their individual utility. But this shows us conditions where if individuals can modify the connections in the network, they, they're still doing it because it maximizes their individual utility. But the result of that is that they get better at maximizing the total utility. The sum of individual utilities goes up. So when there's less conflict in the ecosystem, that means more of the species can be in high biomass at the same time and the total biomass goes up. It wasn't the reason that the individuals in the system did it. They did it just for their own interests. But under those conditions, the changing organization of relationships between them uh, enables the system, causes the system to find uh, configurations that satisfy more of those constraints simultaneously. Right. Um, so as you were talking, uh, you know, one of the thoughts that kept coming to me was this is mirrored in uh, uh, world of business as well, wherein uh, there's this very popular book by Peter Thiel called Zero to One, which uh, popularized this phrase called competition is for losers. And uh, it, it talks about um, how all successful companies go their own ways and uh, competition drives profits to zero. So there is this, again, uh, very interesting specialization and codependence that emerges uh, at a corporation level, wherein um, as a whole, our economy expands, but uh, individually, every company is just trying to maximize their market cap. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good point, right? So you have this notion of uh, if you start off with a sort of primitive notion of survival of the fittest in the, you know, applied to society that it applies to us as individuals. If I can outcompete you, good for me, that's the right thing to do. And at corporation level as well, if I can outcompete other corporations, then good for, good for us, you know, we did well. And uh, whilst that explains organized relationships within the corporation, because they're working together to maximize the profit of the corporation, it's explained by competition between corporations in order to explain, you know, the, how to, that's the prime mover, that's the driver of the cooperation that happens within it. So it's like a sort of selection at a higher level that explains the cooperation within. But you're quite right that the, you know, natural selection doesn't have any interest in increasing competition with anybody. And right? if there's an option to change the relationship in such a way that it makes us less competitive, why wouldn't I do that? Right. right. I'm not interested in decreasing your population density. I'm only interested in increasing mine. And if I can do that by avoiding competition with you, then that's good for me. It, right. it might have the positive side effect that is good for you as well. That doesn't have to be the reason that I did it, but it still, it still places a, a differential change in which relationships change, right? The ones which are most competitive should be the ones which are eased, not the ones which yeah. are ramped up. Exactly. Uh, but that's, um, what did I want to say about that? The, uh, there's, it's easy, however, to get a little bit lost in this notion of, ah, uh, yes, but the reason that I did that was so that I could do better. Right. The reason that I did it's it's really about competition. Really, I do better by using this strategy. And instead, if you think about it as, well, that just wasn't the point. You know, when at the system level, that was never the point. The point wasn't to make you do better. At the system level, that's just what the system does. The system naturally eases the frustrations between things. 
And if you want the system to be more intelligent, right, rather than thinking about, is my company going to do better by this strategy or that strategy? If you think about the network of relationships within a social organization or between uh, corporations, or the at the system level, what's happening is that it's becoming more intelligent. It's learning more about the network of constraints between the components through experience. And the way that it does that is you know, through each of the components just differentially easing the frustrations that they have. It doesn't, you know, thinking about it in a competitive framework is sort of missing the point. It's like, it's not, we can get better by competing less. It's like, no, that's just what happens, right? The, there's a differential easing of relationships and that makes the system smarter. And if you, if you don't see it that way, then you think that, you know, you find yourself, suppose you find yourself in a situation where you're caused to do something you didn't really want to do, right? that there's out of the options that I've got, this is the best option. But I don't really like those options. I'd rather do something else. But the social contracts or perhaps legal contracts or business contracts that I have in this network cause me to take this action. And one way to think about that is, dang, if I could cut those contracts, then I'd be better, right? I'd be, I'd be, able, to, I'd be able to take the, the choice that I wanted. But if you do that, you're making the system as a whole dumber, right? You're literally cutting the synaptic connections of the social structure in which you're participating. And instead of, in, in a natural selection framework, it feels like, look, if you can get away with not cooperating, that's the right thing to do because you only cooperate when you have to. If you could find a situation where you could take benefit from others, but you didn't have to get back, give back, well, that would obviously be the right thing to do. It's not just it's not just that that's what happens sometimes because people are selfish, but it's actually logical, right? I mean, the only thing that's logical is to do the thing that's best for you, right? How could it be anything else, right? But when you think about it at that system level, and you think about, look, we're, we're all part of a system which is learning. We're part of a system which has what I call systemic intelligence that's acquired over its past experience. And the connections and relationships that we have with one another uh, cause us to behave differently. And that way of causing us to behave differently sometimes hurts in the short term, right? But that's the way in which you get out of local optima and into better optima. It's the way in which the total utility can increase, requires that you don't just go to the local optimum. And that requires you to be responsive to those relationships. And when you think about it that way, and when we think about the role of humans in the biosphere more generally, not just in business, but in our relationships to other living things in the planet, perhaps that motivates us to treat that with a little bit more reverence and not just treat other people and other living things and the planet as just resources to be consumed and exploited for our own benefit. Right. right. That, that mindset of growth and profit maximization and performance indicator maximization as being natural and logical, the sort of selection mindset that's transferred into uh, the social realm, that's the root cause of all of our global challenges from climate change to poverty to armed conflict, right? It's like, well, if you're stronger and better able to compete and outcompete others and competitively exclude them and exploit them, well, then you should, because that's the principle by which things get better. But when you think of when you step back and you look at the system level and you think, well, no, the way that things get better is by easing the frustrations between things. And the network of relationships between things is what makes the system smart. And that kind of systemic view gives us different design principles about how we should behave. It means that we should value those relationships rather than try to cut them. It means that we should uh, look for ways to be more compassionately connected to others instead of ways to competitively exclude them. Right, right. I guess you've answered uh, what I was about to ask uh, since we're at the end of a conversation. I wanted to touch upon lessons on living. Essentially, you have a page dedicated on your website called What's Love Got to Do With It? And I found it fascinating for a scientist uh, to have a page connecting uh, their research, their thoughts into uh, something as... Uh, as sort of emotional as love. So you did talk a little bit about it, but uh, you have anything concrete yeah. to say 
on an individual so, level? You know, there, there are what kind of interactions between entities, components, right? I think about, I talk about them very abstractly, but actually I want to bring some heart into it, right? Uh, what kind of relationships between components makes the system as a whole more intelligent? What, what enables the system as a whole to learn? What enables the system to acquire information or knowledge that's held in that distributed network of relationships? Well, it requires not filtering out things to keep from things to discard, not competitive exclusion. What it requires is that each of the components is vulnerable enough to allow its interactions with others to change it. And in so doing, that creates a different organization of relationships that makes multiple things interacting together more than the sum of the parts. That we're in a natural selection framework. We think of ourselves as, well, I'm me, and everything else is just my environment. I don't care about the environment. I only care about me. Right? It becomes self-interest and short-sighted self-interest is the prime mover. Right, But if you were interested in the systemic intelligence of the system you were in, then you would recognize that it's allowing your relationships with others to change, which requires you to be vulnerable. Right, When you interact with another person or when a corporation interacts with another corporation or when humankind interacts with marine life or uh, planetary resources, that interaction, if we approach that interaction as sort of, well, I'm not going to change. I just want to get the most I can out of them. right? I just want to exploit them as best I can because that's the only logical thing for me to do. Why would I do anything else? right? If you approach it that way, then the system can't learn. If you approach it in a way where you allow some vulnerability so that in interacting with others, you don't just change them, but you get changed too. Then that enables the nature of your relationships with others to change over time. And in so doing, it means that you become more than the sum of the parts. Instead of just becoming a bucket full of species that's a jungle out there where they're all just trying to fight for themselves, it's all against all, it becomes more of a harmonious network of living being, more of a sort of Buddhist or Eastern a uh, wisdom tradition way of looking at life where we see each of those components as playing a role within a greater whole. And that way of looking at things, you know, a word that we sometimes use to describe relationships where we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and change an interaction with one another. And in so doing, we create something that's more than just me, that you and I become an us. A word that people use for that sometimes is love. Right. And that's... You know, I'm not, that means I'm not talking about, you know, the brain chemistry kind of love that makes us infatuated. I'm not talking about love that uh, makes us uh, reproduce the species, right? I'm talking about love that makes us uh, vulnerable and makes us, that it does work, that it, it, the kind of relationships that sometimes cause us to do things that we don't want to do. That's the, that's the kind of relationship where love is doing work. And it's not just because it's nice, it's because it, that's the way to make, that's the way to enhance the systemic intelligence of the right. system. Right. I think that's the way to make the leap to next level of organization. Uh, and it's really, I mean, when, when you're speaking, I think it's really the question of what time scale you are being selfish for. I mean, you can be short term selfish or you can be long term selfish. And I think being long-term selfish requires you to be not selfish uh, in the short term. And, uh, and, 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 and I guess that's, that's really relevant to what's happening in the world today. Yeah. There's, a, there's an interesting duality between time scales and organizational scales, right? So if you, like with the tragedy of the commons, right? If you do something that's short-term self-interested, then... In the long term, that's bad for you as well because all the resources are gone. If you did something that was beneficial for others in the short term, that would actually be beneficial for you in the long term. So there's a sort of trade-off between collective interest and long-term individual interest, which is very interesting there. But under the natural selection viewpoint, the only way in which you can get to either longer-term individual interest or short-term collective interest, the only way that you can get there is through a high-level selection process. Right. If, the, if there isn't a higher level selection process, 
you're just never going to get there. Selfishness is the right thing to do. Short-term self-interest is the only, the only uh, prime mover in the system. And that means that, you know, if you don't have a population of planets, then Gaia can't be intelligent, Gaia can't be adapted, Gaia can't be anything. It's just a jungle out there. Um, you know, and if you can survive and reproduce better than someone else in that environment, then good for you, right? That's, that's all there is to it. Uh, but under natural induction, that means that we can see adaptive organization in systems that can't have adaptive organization under natural selection. There can't be, for example, any harmonious web of life if there isn't an adaptive process that can make things harmonious, right? The Gaia can't be a harmonious web of life if natural selection doesn't apply at the planetary scale. Right. But if natural induction applies at that scale, then that can explain why the network of relationships between us as individuals and one another, and also us as humankind and other living things on the planet, can be adaptively organized. It can be a, a product of uh, organization that's put there by the past experience that we've all shared. And in in that way, that gives us a, a reason to treat it with some, well, at least some curiosity, if not some compassion, rather than just treating it as a resource to dig up and burn. Right, right. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Richard Watson. It's been fascinating uh, the last 60 minutes or so. Uh, absolutely uh, loved it. And hopefully, uh, as you do further research, we'll get a very concrete model of how natural induction gets us to the next level of leaps. I'll certainly be on a lookout on your research page uh, for new Thank you so much. It's been I've really enjoyed myself. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great great week ahead. Thank you, you too.